You've heard the story, you've seen some of the clips, right? John Grace and Tariq Labani on their way to Gaza to document aid efforts there when they got caught up in an Egyptian crackdown on protesters. Uh, Tariq started practicing medicine. John started filming. Next thing they knew, they were in jail. Uh, I don't think they expected to be in jail as long as they were. The weeks dragged on. They wondered if they'd ever get out. But while they sat in a cell, many of you, Canadians, started writing letters, started calling their MPs, started making noise, organizing rallies, doing whatever you could to raise awareness, to free them. 50 days later, success. You can only imagine what they were going through when they finally touched down at Pearson International this past Friday night. To uh, get you caught up on it, here's the CBC's Ron Charles. Dr. Tarek Lubani and John Grayson arrived to applause from supporters, accompanied by Lubani's father who traveled to Cairo to meet them. We were detained without charges for nearly two months, along with 600 others. All of us swept up in a brutal roundup. They read from prepared statements punctuated by extraordinary moments of levity, considering the ordeal they've experienced. We sometimes despaired, sometimes quarreled, but we still quarrel. <laughs> They thank the thousands of people around the world who campaigned for their release, with special praise for Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird and his boss. We especially want to thank you, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. We want to thank you, Minister Baird. About that imprisonment, supporters say Grayson and Lubani were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, jailed during a stopover in Egypt on a humanitarian trip to Gaza. Gladstone has his doubts. There was a travel advisory by the government of Canada, don't go to Egypt. Once they got there, there was a curfew by the, by the military government not to be outside after dark. They broke both those rules. Then, then there was an anti-government demonstration and they gravitated to the centre of that. Lubani and Grayson say they misread the brutality of the Egyptian regime, believing they'd be allowed to treat wounded protesters and film the carnage. In hindsight, it's, it's really obvious that we made mistakes. Please welcome to the show, Tariq Lubani and John Grayson. Um, it's, I mean, look, this is it. This is your, it's the clapping, it's the press conferences, it's the lights, it's the thing now that you're back home. It's the hugging. How strange is that? <laughs> is it strange? It's, I mean, we, we've just uh, gotten maybe a, through a tenth of all the wet online stuff in terms of support. Um, the children's drawings, the songs, the videos were blown away by the support that we were shown. And we had no idea because we were just deep, as deep and dark down a hole as you can imagine. Let's play a clip of the father here. This is an amazing clip here. This is a prize that they expect. And even when I used to talk to Tarek, he said, Dad, I may be killed in any of these missions. Don't be sad. I mean, that's a, that's a hell of a thing, man. It's one thing to want to go into a space, but to understand what it does to your family, that must be a, a very different realization for you now. Well, you know, one of... Uh, I, I always realize that I don't walk into these things alone. And when I take people, I always tell them, I always, it's very important for me that their families are on board because none of us walk into it alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, our families supported us. Our families probably suffered more than we did um, because they had so much more uncertainty than we did. And it's, it's just so important to involve them and at the same time never to lie to them. So I did have those conversations with my parents. I did tell them that this is a possibility. I did tell them this was, this was a choice that, that we were making. And, uh, you know, they always loved me and supported me and always didn't want me to go as parents. <laughs> and wanted me to go as human beings. Was there a confidence that came with your Canadian passports that when, when it first started, you thought you were gonna be fine? Well, I mean, the Canadian, let's, let's be very realistic here. We carry as Canadians a very serious privilege. And that privilege goes around with us everywhere in the world. And the fact is that yes, we stayed for 50 days, but there's a counterpoint which demonstrates our Canadian privilege. Everybody was thinking about us, talking about us, and at the end of the day, out of 602 people arrested that day, we're the only two who are out right now. Right. So our privilege stands. The first 24 hours, I, I know I was really in denial. I kept thinking, oh, this is like the G20. We just got kettled, it's a roundup. We'll be out, the, we'll be out tomorrow. Yeah. And 50 days later, I realized, man, was I, did I read that one wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, 
You guys have managed, even in the press, when you landed, there was a little bit of humor that's popped out in the way you guys have talked about it. And I, I, was, and I know humor is a coping mechanism, some, but sometimes it's just what it is. But for you guys, there's no concept of too soon. You were cracking jokes right away. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I mean, uh, yes, right away. If you think that was right away, you should have seen us on day one of the arrest. <laughs> you know, that was right away. There and was this one great moment where we're being interrogated and we've been separated. Tart comes back in, he's got a bloody nose because he's been whacked. And I watch him as he leans slowly forward with his dripping nose to ensure that his blood is dripping onto the in interrogating officer's shoe. <laughs> so I thought, and he boasted about it later at great length. Oh, so the, it's like. The bastard broke my nose. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I thought I, and, and you know, actually the, the context of that is that at that moment, they have complete domination of your body. Yeah. And we knew that, and they knew that. But I, what I wanted to be indomitable was my spirit. Mm -hmm. And so the context of the hit is that the guy says to me, I'm going to wipe that smile off your face by the end of the night. And I said, I doubt it. And then he, he smoked me in the face, yeah. breaking my nose. And uh, I was still smiling. Life lesson, sometimes good to keep your full mouth shut. You know, there are lots of lessons here. <laughs> <laughs> lots of them, I for think sure. we're still learning them. <laughs> when, when you got back, you, and you said you're slowly going through all the positivity, I'm sure you're also coming across the negative stuff. Uh, like, and Margaret went to his piece, called you Grand Sanders, which is one thing, also said, just a couple, cause I was curious what your thoughts are, said you've been portrayed as innocents and all that other stuff, but you're two hardcore anti-Israeli activists, uh, anti-Israel activists who bit, mi mixed up Middle East politics for years, they should have known what they were getting into, also said that many of the media haven't mentioned the fact that you're gay, uh, Mr. Grayson, for fear that it would go worse for him in homophobic Egypt. The real mystery is how anyone concerned with gay rights could support a viciously homophobic movement like Hamas. My read is that these two are troublemakers who knowingly stepped into a volatile situation. They've gotten a lot of mileage out of the incarceration. That, and then she wanted to say it doesn't mean you deserve to be in jail and all that stuff, uh, but that you, no matter how foolish or reckless or disagreeable a decision might be. What do you think when you hear that? Well, the, the interesting thing, I mean, it's, it's all actually very interesting because the fact is we didn't want to go to Egypt. And usually we spend zero time in Egypt when, when I travel. I wanted to go to Gaza, but Gaza is under occupation. And not only is it under occupation, which is condemned broadly in Israeli occupation, it's under siege and has been for the last, I guess, about five, six years now. And the people who put it under siege, initially, well, initially both the Israelis and uh, the Egyptians, then just the Israelis, and now it's back on Israelis and Egyptians again, they don't want to make it easy for humanitarian aid to get in. They don't want to make it easy for help to get in. So we've, we've long been calling for a humanitarian corridor that, that is from the Egyptian side that opens into Gaza so that we can get in there and we can do the work that we want. The fact is, you know, this, this incarceration was not something we wanted. It is not something that we enjoyed. And certainly the, the idea that, you know, we are profiting from it, I mean, this is the kind of profit that anybody in their right mind would forego in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be in Gaza. I wanted to be working. It's I wanted to be in the hospital. They say you're anti-Israel and pro-Hamas. Well, there, at one point, the actual the prosecutor was saying we were Mossad Hamas agents, which is a, a, a fascinating double-barreled sort of construct. And to add sodomite on top of that, the the the, the gay Hamas Mossad agents yeah. would be I mean, not, not like. Given the charges we were supposedly going to be charged with, it wasn't a stretch. We were, we were going to, I mean, one of the main purposes, there are lots of reasons why John was going, but one of the things for me that I was very interested in was talking about gay issues or LGBT issues mm -hmm. in, in Gaza. So when I was going and I was talking to my family about it this time, I said to them, I actually don't know if Hamas is going to arrest me. Because guess what, you know, Hamas is not really the kind of group that enjoys you going in and talking about gay issues with gay Palestinians and, and so on, regardless of the angle. So the idea that we were going in to sort of link up with Hamas as gay activists, <laughs> it's, they're, they're creating a Frankenstein just like the prosecutors were when they said that we were Hamas and, and, uh, and Mossad. There, like with Wente, there's a pattern. And the pattern, all you need to do is look at this little advance piece that was published the day before. But Ezra's not the only one that shares that opinion. It's, it's sure. part of, there's a group yeah. of people who, uh, who that's just how they view the world. It's interesting because also one of the things that happens here, we're trying to do something. 
And that thing is flawed in a lot of ways. You know, I'm a flawed person and my projects are flawed and the things I want to do are flawed. How do you mean? Well, I, I mean, there's probably a million ways to try to bring better, better medical care into Gaza. I'm trying my best here. I really am. I, I genuinely want to do something that improves the, the reality of the Gazans and the world around me. And what happens is there's this category of people, and it's not necessarily people on the right or conservatives. There are, they, these people exist everywhere. Where the moment you start trying to do these things, you get pigeonholed. It becomes very convenient and it allows them to dismiss you. We're not, we're not anti-Israel, we're not really anti-anything. What we want is to be pro-something, pro-human rights, you know, pro-freedom, pro-medical care for everybody. And, and both of our records are really clear on what we're pro. Harper Baird, let's talk about Harper Baird. I mean, so basically, in terms of uh, the, the Harper, Harper Baird dynamic, essentially, they did something really great. They went and made a very unequivocal statement advocating for our release. So at that point, they're representing a nonpartisan movement within the Canadian populace. They deserve thanks for that. Why don't they deserve thanks for that? Of course they should get thanks for that. Of course they should get thanks for that. It was not even a question. He's the Prime Minister of Canada. He, and you don't get out without his support. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that in this particular case, his statements really moved things. His statement really, and, and I think sometimes as Canadians, we underestimate our own value and worth. And when he spoke, people listened in Egypt. And he deserves thanks for that. You know, are there disagreements? Well, yeah. Do I want to have a chat with the guy about other things? Well, yeah. But does that negate that he did a really great thing? No. Thanks for coming, guys. Real pleasure. Thank Thanks you. for that. Thanks for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thank you. John Grayson, Dr. Tarzan, and I will be right back.